into summer we're going to go. It sounds like not many people understanding what to me needs to be done. Seemingly, they make a lot of things up in their mind that the world is supposed to be the way they perceive it, and that's the way they roll, and that's the way they roll. And then you find reality. And so we have a big disconnect everywhere, it seems to me. And I only speak to you all from my experience. So, however that's got me here, however you uh, much credit you would give to it, and then back up what I'm saying, just go do the research. It's, it's all out there for us to see better than what I see lots of people discussing. And so I come here every week, and uh, I'm going to answer a couple of questions here or address a couple of things right up front. I appreciate the communication and clarify things or work it out. Or, or help allow me to work out things that are going on. Before I get too far ahead, though, it's uh, BTWRLM266. Uh, I think this is the t- BTWRLM266, the broadcast for the content leaks uh, on a search uh, tied together with Real Liberty Media or Behind the Woodshed. You should get, get the content leaks. Those are important because they have the really full picture of uh, what the stories are that uh, you get, the news, the notice of what's around in the world. And apparently my my broadcast, my broad net that I've cast uh, in the world is a little bit too much for a lot of people, I suppose. And I've, I've explained why I go a broadcast in the notice of the world to show you that it's not a different thing anywhere you look. It's all the same plan, uh, t- custom tailored for the specific area. So if you see one plan somewhere, you know it's happening to you someplace else. Uh, that uh, apparently confuses a lot of people. And then I suggest upon those where I can, and only in general, how to apply certain principles I've learned to bring things into control local to you, or or some measure of control, at least bring it into a little bit finer line where at least you, what I call having a word in your mouth, you have what you need to respond properly to all the oppression you find. This is not not something that's um, incidental some minuscule thing. The, the oppression is there for a reason. It's there by plan. And uh, you have to find out what that is. The only way to do this, as I found, you have to identify that in truth, not in what your imagination is. And you have to address it on its terms. A lot of people don't like to hear that. They like to fabricate the world as the, that it ought to be. And they press it forward, not, re, not having any basis for what they're talking about or don't really understand it. If the world ought to be that way and it's not, maybe someone's driving the the wagon and you don't have control of it. And you're going to take a while before you get any kind of control if that's if that's what's ever going to happen. Likely it's not going to happen. Why? Because you're not addressing it on its terms. You're making up, fabricating a reality, saying it's not the way it's supposed to be, and then you, you go into your fetal position, you go into your crawl back into your hole, or you go out and you try to prove to prove things, I guess. I'll just leave it like that. Leave it in the neutral. Just prove things. And that's fine to prove things, but are you efficacious in what you're doing? Are you just proving things in order to be uh, make it yourself important to you, improving the reality of what you've fabricated, uh, to be what it is and make declarations that really don't have any substance. And to that, to that, uh, a couple of questions have come. Uh, uh, about one was looking at someone's work, and I, I want to answer this way instead of going through the email. It would take way too long for me to to answer in the email, and I'll do this in an abbreviated way and not identify too much more than to send the message out. And, and uh, thank you for the for the um, question, and thank you for the insight. And thank you, first of all, to Normalization of Ignorance and uh, Deprogram.org. Both of you folks, I thank you very much for reposting the broadcast, re-allowing people to re- to vi- view it, to listen to it there. Not view it. I don't do that too well. I'm still working on that project, Vince. It's just not going to happen right now. Uh, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm not. It's, I'm over. I'm just over, almost overwhelmed to even respond to a whole lot of anything at this point. There's so much information that could be addressed that I'm just not. I'm going to have to reassess how I address things. But at any rate, uh, thank you to Normalization of Ignorance on YouTube. Uh, you're actually getting more views on your website than I think I am getting in other other places uh, combined. So appreciate, really appreciate that for just getting the word out. And I solely say that not to have you guys, any of or you folks, you gals, listen to my voice. I really don't come here to say more than what you need to know and do. I don't come here to hear myself talk. It's just a waste of time. If I look around and I thought about it, I would stop talking because... Not not too many actually want to hear it, and I don't know why that is, except people have come to a point where they've fabricated what they believe the world is and ought to be and don't dis- 
will not address anything in the context of the way it really is. In other words, if you think the world was supposed, the Constitution said it was supposed to be this way and we're going to impose it the way I have determined, you're not going to go too far. You may be able to look impressive on all the misstatements that you make, uh, but it's not going to be really proper, nor nor the, the condition, and you'll never solve that. You'll be over always having a small group of people that come to you, watch your stuff, and think what you're doing is, is really important, and it's really not. It's really not, not the bigger problems that we need to address, nor is, is the way that uh, is being addressed, uh, way things are being addressed, actually done in the proper way as I view it. And I, I'm specifically speaking, I mentioned it before, and it's becoming more and more of a, of a, of a thing. Uh, to me, it's becoming more of a bread and circus. And I don't mean to insult anybody, uh, but I want you to come to terms with what you're really doing. Uh, it's this, this First Amendment audit stuff. I, I get the idea, and, and congratulations to everyone that takes your time and gets out and does that. But for the purpose of just showing your reality is imposed on somebody who has another thing to do in the world, that's not really testing a whole lot. Uh, maybe you're expo- exposing these things for yourself, uh, but they're not, and other people that believe what you're doing is is correct, but it's not not really going to help anything. It doesn't, it, listen, if you listen to what I'm telling you, you're in the face of an occupation. They don't care. They're just going to get rid of you. They're just, gonna, and that comes in a lot of ways, whether that ends up being a bullet to your brain or, or, or just put you in the system and, and put you in jail, put you in a cage for a while, or ignore you. That, that's, not, that's not actionable. None of that stuff will ultimately do much of anything. Now, what, why do I say that? Because I've done a lot of it. I don't know if I can do it, all of it. I've done a lot of it. And, it, and it, none of it really goes much of anywhere. Uh, and so I've gone to the point where I am because I've followed the path of actually what functions, not what looks to function, but what functions. So anyway, thank you, Normalization of Ignorance and uh, Deprogram.org, the gateway of freedom technology, uh, for posting, uh, re, re, re broad, reposting this uh, broadcast. Appreciate that. And all the work you do on the graphics, whatever you're doing there, appreciate all that. Uh, don't talk with any of you, but I, I do uh, do think it's cool. We got a confirmation in, uh, on some of the stuff I was talking to you about last week. I'm going to touch a little bit of that before I get to that, though. I want to touch two, two questions here. Uh, one is... Uh, commenter on youtube and thank you very much for that i get to look at that and then vince advanced it to me so thank you for that for that to vince about a particular type of a situation and then i want to address a um, an inter- a critique that i was asked to do on a uh, someone that's posting on a site first of all i want to touch these terms and a concept uh, that i've talked about and i want us to be very careful on, on the subtlety of what i say uh, it's really in categories and, and, and applications and and you could go down trains of thought Uh, on a certain concept but it doesn't mean that that's the end and you come back to the beginning of a new concept and run that out and you look at the end of that and you hold all these categories separate that that's where you're going to start to understand uh, how to keep fluid in what you might find wherever you go because there's really not uh, this thing is such a dimensional type of approach of what's going on You, you literally have to be fluid in how you address it not everything will fit into any one category and so I, I'm resistant to stuffing anything into a category and only talking into things in possibilities like in a, a semantic way. Uh, okay, if we, if, we, if we took this definition and put it in this way and stuck it in this scenario, what would be that outcome? Then we come up to what we think an outcome would be, and then we put that as a possibility, not that it is. And we do that for a lot. We, I say anybody who does this uh, should do this does this for all kinds of scenarios. You build up all these scenarios. And I say do that because when you go out and you start beat, are beaten down by these, these people that are the authorita or getting confronted with it, that's what you, how you have to move because you're going to deal with someone. There's a brain and a body and a spirit in there that you're going to have to deal with ultimately. Now, you can kick it back to your foundation, but that will only be what's in your hip pocket, and you're not going to present all that. So to more less esoteric, right specifically was uh, can I come or – have I ever compared the term sufferance and suffrage, suffrage, not suffrage, I'll pronounce it that way because that's what you suffer. <laughs> you continue on an obligation and duty, a civilized obligation and duty, so I call it suffrage. It's pronounced suffrage, F-R, yeah, suffrage is uh, really together. And uh, don't get, I'm not getting into the entomology and where all this can go. I just want to address the question. Have I compared the term sufferance and suffrage? 
And then uh, the, the continuing quiet st- statement, which brings context, and I'll touch this in a moment. Uh, one is conquered and defeated status, basically the other simply a right to vote, which is suffrage. But when in uh, when in reality it is the right to vote as a conquered people, a benefit crumbs to resemble freedom to the conquered masses allowed to be tenants, owners on their conquered lands. And so that's the, the observation. And have I looked at these two terms? Well, yes, I have, and and then you put them in categories, and and so and jurisdictional issues, and where they're the context by which you would speak to these terms. And I'm not going to go through a full blown discussion here. I'm just going to go through a lot of uh, just the, the basics on how it uh, hit me to respond. I went quickly to the internet, like all y'all can do, and I just brought up some words. Again, it's just without context, and we just see the basis of this. And I only do this so I can talk to you. I already have my my word set in my mind already about how this works and where I place it, so I kind of move right along pretty quickly, but that won't help anybody on the broadcast. Uh, so I went through and uh, and brought up some, uh, you'll get the links in the, in the broadcaster, about this point. Again, it's it's not more than a word study and then put it in a place. And so let, let's address uh, suffrage first. And I've talked about this before, and I get it right down to the point where it's just, a, to me, it's just, to speak to most people, it's just a franchise. And so we can get right on the wiki for all, you know, it's a general purpose, uh, quick look, go and get the wiki, look through it. Uh, you'll refine this as you move through, and then it re- gets refined again as you actually apply it. But suffrage is pretty simply uh, a political franchise. And consider these franchises, see, uh, we've got to get to the franchise, because that's that's what you're... All y'all that think about fictions and corporates and corporations and privileges and 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 we we could and I won't do this but we could get to what this the uh, definitional distinction between an inalienable right is and an unalienable right is right here because this is an inalienable right it's it's a it's a it's a civilized privilege that can be conditioned and you'll see in the in this con- case is suffrage or a political franchise it's pretty simply the right to vote. And so that's kind of the limit of it all right there, but it's a franchise. And I, I get focused more on that. What is this thing? What's the status of this thing? I'm not going to get too deep into all this. I just, uh, again, I don't know why we would want to. It's one of those things once you learn, you just move on. You will understand when you do this, uh, when you, why you register as a voter. And then you go look at the jurisdiction there on the card and what you're signing your name to. And there's a whole bunch of... Uh, I'm gonna. Oh, I better not use that word. It'll blow a bunch of people's minds. Uh, a bunch of attachments that happens jurisdictionally just on signing the voter registration card. And understand the word voter is sitting there. So I've talked about this uh, this word suffrage before. I talked about the franchise. I'm just gonna go hit it on what's basic, consistent with the question relative to a conquered people, the status eventually. But let's get it laid out. So it's simply the suffrage is a is a franchise, a political franchise. It sits inside that political jurisdiction. And uh, you can under, I won't go anymore. There's a lot to say here. Uh, then, uh, so let's go look at the definition. I'll just pop up Miriam Webster's dictionary. And it's got a couple definitions here. And uh, a short intercessory prayer, usually in a series. And so I want to point out now, think jurisdictionally here. A prayer, uh, this has a pretty, pretty central uh, authority here, uh, jurisdictionally. So consider that. And then we'll get back to this word, uh, this uh, this condition of the prayer after. But once we establish the right to vote, and then where this prayer is also used in your uh, legal system. And again, I'm not putting any context on it. I'm not saying, oh, this means it's a church. No, I'm saying that's the jurisdiction that you would be uh, uh, looking at potentially using. It doesn't mean it's coming in a religious concept. But it might be through the same methods of um, construction and establishment. Uh, anyway, so keep everything uh, in a generality until you have a specific to apply it to. So it's an intercessory prayer. Uh, number two is a vote given in deciding a controverted question or electing a person for an office uh, of or trust. So understand what you're establishing in your vote to uh, if you have a vote. And then look very careful at this. They say electing, but you're only voting. Understand the distinction here in an office or trust. And so there's these hierarchical connections of a world and reality that exists before all of us oughts that we need to pay attention to. And uh, so we have a number three. Here's the right of voting, particularly the right of voting, a franchise. 
also the exercise of such a right. So we have the right to vote and we have the exercise of vote. It's still called, a, it's still under the term suffrage, but it's a franchise. So we see the, the concurrence with the wiki and a franchise, uh, we can look at that, again, is a privilege bestowed upon you. And uh, and this this has an interesting inter inference when you get to that definition. But first, one more uh, s uh, support, if you will, just off the Internet, just going pretty quickly and light here in the legal dictionary that you can find, the, the free dictionary, the legal dictionary, cab suffrage of government. It's restricted here in this context to government. Vote. The act of voting, so the the act, not not the right of it, but the act of it. Uh, the number two, the right of uh, suffrage is given by the Constitution of the United States, Article One, Section Two, to the electors in each state, and shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. And it gives a citation. I won't bore it with you. You get the link if you want to see this stuff. Let's go back, and I've mentioned this before. You have a voter, and then here we have an election, and you have a vote. But then this is for only for electors. Go look very carefully, folks. As I've said this all before, I'm not going to get too more, much more deep. I've said it back in the back, in, in the history, in the memory hole, as it were. Uh, in the Constitution, it's spent, it says uh, vote. It doesn't say voters. It says electors, and it says who those electors are. If you, I just ask the question: If you're not an elector, as the def, defined by the Constitution. Do you have a actual right to vote? And this is the thing about electing. And so we have to look kind of, kind of look at this. I'm not going to give any meaning to it. Uh, it's an interesting conundrum. I've talked a lot about this. I've also told you that in actuality, the electors of the Constitution that this, this is, these citations refer to and the right to vote actually attaches to some minuscule amount, 540 uh, something, well, whatever the Whatever the, uh, the 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 ledges the, the electors are in the two sta the two electors per state I can't remember what the, it's point zero 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 six something percent of the population actually votes actually elects the officers so this is uh, now we, we elect the officers to what well through the constitution which is also has a kind of another term we're not going to get into them uh, you can if you want compact charter these are all international terms they're all interchangeable for pretty much a treaty can go through this. I don't get too wrapped up. I just say, okay, well, all these words have different types of meaning, but they're pretty similar too. And so in their similarities, let's work through those because that's the most, uh, that's the thread we can work with all of them. Uh, but here, this is suffrage uh, as defined by the Constitution, not anywhere else. And so on a national level, you only have electors for the offices. And so this is the right, people think they have the right of suffrage. Well, they don't unless they're elected. They're an elector, actually, in the capacity of those officers. So what is this inalienable right? The civil imposition, which can be conditioned. Not the unalienable, which, which is really antecedent or natural, if you will, to you. And these all open lots of discussions, these, these concepts. But uh, once you, and I, and I say this, and I said that it opens up the conversation, understand I've looked at a lot of these, these, these things. So this is what I come to you with, understanding these things at least the limit of what I researched, which was quite ex has been quite extensive over the last three decades. I didn't, I haven't come here, what did they say, I didn't fall off the turnip, ye turnip truck yesterday? Well, maybe I did, but I've been on a turnip truck quite a long time. So I may have fallen off again because I haven't quite figured out how to stay on the truck. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I've been around for a while doing this, and I was important to it. I made it important to me. I wanted to understand what the heck happened to America. What, what happened to how we were brought up, and all of a sudden, it just like overnight, I'm looking at, Literally, my mortality. I've talked about that. Literally did not know in the moment whether or not I would be gunned down like you see is common today. I, well, I don't know if I was the first, but I was one of the first where the cops would gang up on you on like traffic stops and gun you down. And that was a shock to me because I coming out of the forest, I didn't know nothing. I got a little bitty town trying to run away from all this nonsense. I was in a little bitty town with a little bit bigger community they call community. I'm getting my life threatened, not a lie. Traffic lie. Not not that the fact that the traffic was a lie. No, that was a lie too. But I didn't know about all that then. No, they made up something to try and get uh, to get me in trouble. Okay, so that's just my my beginnings. If you want to understand where I come from, to try and figure this stuff out. And so I had to start seeing what the reality was. Ought not be this way, but it was. So I can't be living in my my imaginary world. I got to figure out what happened. And so this is decades ago. And so going through these, these these studies, you start doing this. So let's get over to these word studies, and then you start putting them in context. 
And they, when you have a word that has different meanings in different places, you have to leave them all in their context, in their own particular place until you can apply them. Then you start to refine. You don't do it on what you think is the refining point without investigating what the mass had, the power has decided it was going to be that you're going to definitely be subject to when you go thinking that you have all the power in the world. And really the only, the only thing saving you is someone's restraint looking at you thinking, well, Okay, I've got what I got to tell them. I know who this is. I can puff my chest out and do a little bit of a throw a ta. I'll see where that goes. But ultimately, that's a no. It's a non-starting condition, and they balance the risk assessment. You don't. You're just being. You're just walking yourself into front of the bus, and they're trying to steer it around whatever obstacle you are. But you don't even know that you're being an obstacle. Uh, let me get to the franchise here. Franchise is a freedom or immunity from some burden or restriction vested in a person or group. Now, let's not get all fancy on the person and group. These, these are in fiction and in, in, in the legal entity statuses, but notwithstanding that, look at the point of it, the freedom or immunity from some burden. What have I told you about your civil rights? But that's the right to equally agree to be subject to exactions of every kind. This is saying a franchise is to be relieved of some burden like that. And so this is a franchise is a very interesting thing, but it's inside government. And uh, you won't get it unless you're inside government of some sort. Uh, number two, a special privilege granted to an individual or group, especially the right to be and exercise the powers of corporation. And now you start to refine what this, these definitions do, and you see they're all really speaking pretty much in one context as well. Even if you expand, tried to leave them open, they're going to confine themselves. And this is what I started to learn to identify and do. So I'm doing that for you today just to mention it. B, uh, 2B is a constitutional or statutory right or privilege. It doesn't say a, granted, it doesn't say a, an antecedent right. It doesn't say an, inalienable, an unalienable right. It doesn't say, say anything like that. It says this is a constitutional or statutory right or privilege. So we, the way I would read this is a constitutional, statutory, and privilege all is all the same thing. Or here is con conjunctive. Whatever you do, you're going to be in the same authority. It's still inside an organized, established government. Why do we make governments? So that we can protect ourselves from the criminals. We're not that neat and cool a people. For our, however, I hear about the, the non-aggression principle, push come to shove, you're going to, you're going to pop up with something you don't like that someone's doing. You say, but I'm not doing it. Well, at some point, maybe you don't, but there's those other guys that do. And, and the law, and this is another thing I, I want to I jump back and forth a little bit, but not uh, too much here. One of the observations was that the government gave us uh, the courts. No, it, it, you can't use secure and gave. If the rights are to be secured by your government, uh, to totally, overall, generally, uh, then it, the, the word that secure is not give. No, that was the secure, the existing thing that it was established to do is it must protect. And so I see some terminological problems in what I was witnessing to this week, uh, this weekend in trying to address all these issues too on another subject I'll be touching. Uh, but be careful on how you describe things. And it's very important to just really start to get more accurate. Sometimes I'm a little loose on that. Uh, but uh, I always gauge that depending on whether or not anybody's going to do anything with it. If, if the likelihood of someone actually doing something with what I'm saying, I'm not going to be quite as technically right than someone saying, hey, listen, I've got a problem with my property. They're coming to take it. You know, what would you suggest to look at on how to address it? That's how I'm going to get right down. In fact, that's my first suggestion. Go right into the statutes. Go into what, what they're going to be using by what they say, not what you think they say. And so this is the makes all the difference. But the constitutional right, this is another definition for franchise. Uh, C, uh, the right or license granted to an individual or group to market a company's goods or services in the particular territory. Also, a business granted such a right or license. Uh, just opened a new food franchise down the street is the example. And you've heard about these. The franchises on the, on the, a highway are well as utility franchises as well. All these companies that come in and use the uh, the easements uh, alongside the easements for their power and their communication. These are all franchises that are all extended uh, by uh, by a process within your local jurisdictions. Uh, that's the counties.
And so it's a, for another franchise, it's 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 given. It's given by a particular uh, set of rules. Uh, territory involved in such a right. So did you understand that the franchise could be the a, a, a domain that you get to do this in? Right. Everyone understands this stuff when you see it in application. In this case, the examples are the right of membership of a professional sports league and a team is operating organization having such membership. Uh, the example here is he's uh, the best player in the history of the franchise. And so anybody who's into sports and you support that, you're supporting a corporate franchise, a special thing that's a re relieving you from the burden, some burden. In other words, you can't do it without this. In other words, if you see it this way. And this is where you start to realize, wait a minute, that's not what I was uh, brought up to believe. This country of America is supposed to be free, right? Well, they say it's a free government, not a free people. If you look really uh, free people, I don't mean that in the context of the political either. Just you and you and, uh, and your loved ones, men, women, and your offspring. That's not what this thing says. Remember, I told you the people, the whole people are not the whole people. The whole people are the legislature. The officials that are the uh, the people that voted locally literally voted because there's no electors there. So anyway, you, you start laying this out, and you start realizing this is uh, uh, this is a very specific thing to deal with. And I get to that point because it's specific within a context. And let's move. I'm going to get remind us we're talking toward the conquered, defeated status, and the right to vote, and all this other stuff. And I'm going to be cautious here to not get wound too tight on it. And I'll try to make a distinction that I told you is going to be really important to understand about not the transparent, how you not how you can't see this in a way. You won't know one way or the other. So remember that, that little nugget when I get over to there. So this franchise is all important as an inalienable right, not an unalienable right. And it's a civil right. It's a civil uh, benefit. And uh, so that's it. So that we see what, a su what suffrage is. But let me go back before I move on. Uh, to show you how the system is pretty consistent with this and where we start to move this idea uh, a little bit, what it might be done, uh, used, and where in context. Uh, the, remember the word prayer was involved with this, an intercessory prayer. And so I don't know if anybody's river, how many of you have written paperwork. And, the, and we used to come up in the 90s, it used to be what you had to do. And there was a theory that if you didn't do this, that's why people, the, the so-called patriots were losing. And, and, and until I started to understand more, uh, more and more clearly how to how to write paper i realized you don't need that and it, you do a different way that's the remedy that you're looking at but a prayer was added always at the end of your paperwork which, which really galled me all the time anyway i'm not praying to the court well in fact you are but it is also a suffrage isn't it see so it's it's <laughs> You start to see the close nature of this whole thing, uh, but, but a prayer nonetheless, a prayer is a, is a term subject to different meanings, but in legal context, it refers to the specific amount asked for as damages at the end of a complaint or petition. A prayer gives the judge an idea of what is sought, and the defendant who fails to answer may have a default judgment against, against him for the amount prayed for. Now, uh, not to go off a little bit, not to go off too far, but just to say uh, you, the, you can do the prayer, but if you look at what the damage is, that's typically in a common law setting a uh, case. That not You don't have that prayer is not necessarily made in an equity case, which is a, a, a straight up demand. You demand what your what law requires. And so uh, when you start looking at the jurisdictional remedies, then you start also seeing the subtleties. But prayer... We can obviously jump over to a religious context, can't we? And that's what you look at. The when people look at the the construction of the construction of the courts, you have all the pews all lined up like they are. You have all the choir area for the choir with the jury. You have the judge on a on an uh, on an altar. who has got all his all his uh, plaques and, and finery, whatever the heck it is. He comes in his robe. You, you can see the uh, well, I can't use that word. You can see the uh, church context. And, and a long time ago, it's a lot of uh, fun uh, thought to, to make up all kinds of stuff about walking into that court uh, underneath really the medieval presentation, bringing your own retinue, your own heraldry, all everything else, just to tell them that they got the wrong guy, and that, that you had your own uh, that you had your own stuff going, you had your own sovereignty, and then and then impose the the uh, the uh, insult. 
for, for even asking you to come into the court. Uh, but that's all that's all games. We've never we, I never followed through with that. The point is, is it puts you to your it puts your mind in a certain context of how this all applies when you look at a prayer being a part of an intercessory part of a complaint. What is this place that they call the courts? I'm not going to answer that here. I'm just going to say there's consistencies throughout that you keep going. So that's what suffrage ends up being. It's pretty universal, actually, within the context of even a lawfully established government that is not an occupying force or a conquering government. So I want a, a conquering a foreigner, foe. Uh, so I'll understand now we, we can split that requirement that it looks like a here that we are a conquered people by it. And I wanted to make that distinction for uh, Mark uh, V. Thank you uh, again on the, on the comment. Uh, so let me now move over. So that's the, that's your basics uh, quickly on the suffrage. Uh, and uh, now we get to the sufferance. Uh, the only understanding I had about sufferance was uh, an estate. It's a tenancy at sufferance. Uh, and I got a link for that, and it came right up. Uh, but more the when I thought of it as an estate, there's tenancies at will. There's tenancies for life. There's tenancies at sufferance. There's lots of tenancies which are subholdings. They're um, uh, inferior to the landholder, but they have the rights of the landholder given. That's what your agreement uh, is within the context of your estate. And most likely you're writing a document that establishes these things. Right? So this is not really, um, this is a completely different thing, and it's tied actually to estates. Well, estates are trusts. Estates are established. They're under state law. Again, this is a different, same type of thing, but the, I don't blow it out because, listen, without all this stuff, we'd have people fighting all the time over this land. I mean, this is what it's all about. It seems we got to have a place. We want to have our own place. We don't want to live like the Soviet. You know, we want to be able to be self-determinant in our little spot or have a place to uh, a respite uh, against the uh, the whole and this country, United States, actually sets that up. It doesn't mean that you'd be a criminal, but but it does, short of that, it does supposedly provide for this ability to be beyond an estate into what is possessed, a possession held exclusive to others. But So to me, the context of uh, t- sufferance has not, not even in the same ballpark. It's an estate, one of the many estates you can have an interest in land. And so let me move on to suffering. I have this suffering, suffrage, and sufferance was another thing that popped up. You can get all this. The suffering is this continuous uh, hardship or pain or distress that you're under. Well, I use the word suffer. You suffer this, uh, all this. Equal rights, you suffer equal rights. It's the imposition. You suffer it until you don't. And they, they impose that until as a benefit. And then that's why you get some of these people saying, I don't accept the benefit. Well, not, okay, fine. If, if you're doing anything that indeed uh, to nullify that, then you are accepting the benefit. And a lot of times you've done that before you even got there. So you don't, and people don't even understand how this all works. Uh, and so, uh, so that this is, so let me get it back to the context. We now understand a little bit about suffrage and sufferance. Uh, how is that to hear in, in one, in a conquered or defeated status? Well, tenancy at sufferance is not a defeated status. So that would be answering right that up front. That's a misinterpretation of that. And that's fine. We just correct it. Uh, and the other simply a right to vote. Well, that isn't, that's a civil right. That's inside, not a destruction. That's inside a govern, I'll go say governance. Because th- at that point, we don't understand whether it's de jure, de facto, or, or impo- imposed, an occupier. In the context of conquest, it could come up, but usually there's a doc, there's a, an action, a definite action of conquest or a condition. A lot of times the condition is the people that have been overrun have no capacity to come back in any, in any meaningful way. And, and again, no derogation. Don't, don't take this in offense. I, uh, anyway, uh, I don't mean it in any offense at all. It's just the way people do, and we see the evidences of the problems. Uh, the uh, Indian people of the United States, I believe, are a conquered nation of people. They're not going to rise up in any any meaningful way. They've been actually put into a trust, and their lands have been handed over to them uh, as pursuant through that trust. They're not actually a foreign uh, a state, a state of government at, in the United States as normal states are, as somebody I re- heard uh, that I'm going to be talking about here in a moment uh, did refer to them. They're not actually that kind of a state. Uh, that nation of people are not coming back. They're pretty well conquered. They may have the right of vote. I don't know, but they're all based on the charters of the corporations that have been set up that the Indian people themselves in those in- so-called tribes don't understand. And this is where I talked about these things called stocking horses. 
and stakeholders. They've, they've converted all this thing over into corporate holding. What you see is the whole legal system. It's the whole establishment. It's what it is. And until you get that, that understood and that's in your place in there or how they're going to be treated in there, you're, you're, we are not going anywhere. We're never going to unite up as a people, even some of a conquered that can help bring out the rest. Uh, I mean, uh, the the man, the mass who starts to see the others were conquered and grabs them up together, and we all go back out and say, "Wait a minute, this is this finally. Let's stop this nonsense." Uh, so, back to sufferance and suffrage. A conquered people are just told essentially they're given some freedom, the range of movement within a confines, and they they can have voting and they can have estates of suffrage. They can have all kind. They can have everything, and they're still in the conquested state. You can have an occupied people, it's the same thing. The administration of the occupier allows for the same things too. Now we start wondering, well, why did they do that? Well, they, I told you, you don't want to piss off the natives. And the natives understand that that is the condition, whatever, the conquest and their bad, if they're conquest, they really don't have a, a power. This is where they're, they really are done. But they can s- s- swing the hearts and minds of those that are not, the people that they're around, and they come together. The mass of people that can move in the proper way to overthrow now the occupier is not a conquest of people. Those occupiers can uh, manage, administer this occupation and look exactly like the life you thought was supposed to be, which will have a little bit of roughness at the edges, which is really what the First Amendment auditors are kind of poking poking around on. But I've offered a different way and a different path on how all that works. I, I hear some of these conversations on that. I, I don't wouldn't last a couple seconds. I don't have that kind of patience to do things that way. First of all, a lot of it's frivolous. Uh, sometimes when they get in your face, I've got to make a record real quick because I got two things to do. I've got to make the record before he wants to shut me down, and I got to do it before he wants to shoot me anymore. And I take that very serious, and I don't take that as a paranoia. It's a condition, and I can do that pretty quickly. When I focus on that, I get it done pretty quickly. I told you the investigative reporter pops up pretty quickly in me, and so does the one that needs to assert the notice of rights. No, not on and on and on. No, only specific to the condition. And so, uh, the suffrage and suffrage, you would not, know, unless you're a conquered people, which I don't really, see, I told you my, James Montgomery is is a proponent, and I don't know if he's still alive or not, he used to write books a long time ago, he was a proponent that the American people were conquered. I'm not of that attitude. I still see we have a lot more people, if we would just get together, we can finish this. And for my uh, the criticism of uh, Larkin Rose, his little videos about the one dot over there on the, supposed in the District of Washington and all the th- billions of dots that are, well, the millions, excuse me, hundred of million dots v- against, that are against Washington, D.C., was very credible uh, review of how stupid this whole condition is. How many dots of, uh, of the people are being controlled by a few dots over in Washington or in your local county? And I don't mean going out and insurrect because it, it, this is, I'm talking to a bunch of really, bunch of children right now, I guess, for the most part, for the most of you that want to go out and think that you know better. We really don't. There's, we're here for a reason. And a lot of it wasn't so bad when you start really getting into it and you start parsing through how all this really kind of ties together. But as you know, I'm not here agreeing with all of it either. We're, fi- I'm, I'm fighting it as much as I can where I see it made it stop making sense. Anything that made sense uh, and it's something of importance I'm I'm engaging with myself. I don't know about doing a First Amendment audit. I mean, at that point, I don't know about that point. I don't want to criticize that too much. You're doing what you're going to do, but I'm seeing that we could go much further. And if it's truly a problem, we need to really do the, the jujitsu on these guys and, and get the message out and the substantial thing that shuts it all down not from our point, but from their side. And they stop toying with you as an occupier. Uh, so the occupier, they'll give you, an occupier will give you uh, your civil management of your life. They will not, in fact, a smart occupier will not interfere with your civil courts. You see that in the Lieber Code. As I say, the, 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 the thumbnail blueprint of that is, is the Lieber Code, how they do it. You, they will establish everything you see. The closest you're going to get to identify it is the gold fringe flag, but that doesn't mean anything either, so don't get too wiped up. And I'm just pointing out, they could be so subtle in how they've done it, how they've set up around you, but everything functions in a certain way. And this does speak to the next thing, because that certain way is what you figure out, and that certain way may not have to meet certain parameters that you think ought to happen, you, as I said, when I was looking at, at my mortality with five cops wanting to shoot me for a thing they made up, 
uh, uh, three decades ago. I'm thinking, what, where would America go? And what, this isn't supposed to be this way, but here I'm looking at it. So I could keep my head in the in the sand, in the clouds, and I probably wouldn't be here today. Or else I assess things really, really quickly and figure out I'm in a in a disadvantage disadvantage here. I better if I if I intend to live the next slight moment, I better figure things out real quick and start working with what I have and not what I think I have. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I've talked too much more on this uh, conquered, defeated, and whether I've addressed the real problem. Uh, let me see, the, the crumbs, the benefit and the crumbs, that is one of those testing things. As I just pointed out, the suffrage is a, is a, is a given right, a privilege. And that's done to keep people thinking they have a voice. And right in the Constitution, it says they don't relative to federal officers, but no one pays attention. Not no one, a few. And Clint Richardson did, I think, did a video explaining all that. Uh, to his vast credit, I don't know what to say more than he he does the research and puts it out there. I wish people would start paying attention. It's not everything or how I might do it, but he does a perfect, absolute perfect job enough to get people to try and get it. I don't go away. He doesn't doesn't get it. Oh, I think it was no, Nota. I think it was with Nota. Fascinating thing what he did there. Uh, the creature that he uh, that the, the video created for him to, to tell you about the uh, none of the above. And why? I thought that was great. I don't think many people appreciated it. So, uh, anyway, so you're going to conquer people. You know you can't can't rise up and you're having some trouble, but there's ways to work inside that. I've, I've offered those things, let's say, to the Indian people in their land, and their land is is being mistreated uh, like everybody's land. So here we see actually the, the people are people. You know, the, the different different people that are being controlled, however, are controlled. But uh, suffrage would be handed to you to keep you thinking that you have a, a thing to say. Those of us that realize it's not have backed out of that. It take And then for uh, for me, it cuts out at least a, a handful of statuses that I get to say uh, is, one le- is a proof less that can be used that I didn't think about that, that is attached to me uh, unknowing. They, they can't do that now. It's mainly uh, what I do. It's not true that if you if you vote that you then you have a, a complaint. No, your 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 vote, your consent was was the vote. It's those that are outside of that that are being wrongly imposed. And I put that condition wrongly because this is the other standard people are missing. You have to assert your right and that you have it. Uh, they don't presume that on you. And it's not just what you think you say. You have to bring the rational basis underneath it, possibly, and the reason. And, and it may or may not be recognized. And people don't under, quite understand how that works. And that alone tells you there's a, an overriding control. And you're not going to change that. You can think you are. You can rally against, talk about it. You can talk bad about it. But it's going to be there to control your life. And you're not going to rise against it for all the yakking you do. It's still going to continue to control your life. Because you're not doing whatever else you thought. Or you're doing it on the slide and just haven't got caught, which is a definition all of its own. Uh, so the uh, crumbs that they give us are many. Uh, the the benefits that are there, uh, if they, uh, uh, and I don't know how to identify it for you, it's, it's something when you look at your life, what do you need, you find out it's not necessarily government uh, until you go to the point where you want a remedy. And and I'm not, and I, without the rules set up by us as people in a society on what that remedy is, there would be no way to get a remedy, ever. And there, there and for as much as the people that uh, don't want to agree to this, as I, you're going to have gangs roving the streets at some point. Uh, they will, and if it's not, it'll be small groups of people taking what they want. And it also holds. There's another thing, an important thing. It holds the bar of what uh, what respect there is left, or or at least approximately so. And I see that there's just no respect anymore in people. It's really fascinating. And the only thing we have now is this. Object, I call it just the objective basis. It's this so-called law. You gotta tell people that they shouldn't steal from others, then we're in some trouble. And then that's the, that's the system that we have for as uh, wondrous as uh, some of it might be, like I talked to you about the land law. But see, that has a backside over there that says the right, and the reason why it's so good is because you do have a right to speak counter to the government, and they, st- it, it, those thing, those in the government can't really do much about it. Not lawfully anyway. And so now we're at a different type of thing uh, when their government goes bad. Now what? That's a whole other thing on top of all this. So uh, conquered people, yeah, you're given crumbs. Uh, occupied people are given crumbs. Conquered people are told what uh, condition they exist in, and they're not going to be able to do that much about it. Uh, the 
allowed to use, bring up the concept of a resemble freedom uh, the, to the conquered masses. Well, the masses are big enough here that they're not actually conquered, I think. Uh, James Montgomery would uh, probably disagree with me. Uh, my contention is that, that we haven't yet it doesn't mean we can't. And I'm holding out, I may be holding out a pretty high, high optimism there, but, uh, cause it doesn't look like it's going to happen. I agree with him at some level. We are, we act as if we're conquered and don't know it. But I don't think we're actually conquered quite yet. And I think, uh, anyway, I'll finish there. Uh, tenants and owners, they're not a conquered land, on land. They, they are relative, that's relative to their agreement on whomever owns the underlying land. That's a really contract based. And if you look at a constitution that these officers are supposed to be done, at least in America, in the United States of America, uh, the, uh, there's no impairment that may come to an obligation to contract. So you can address that. Another, that's another way to address those, that part. So I hope I touched that. Let me move on now to a, a critique I was asked to do. And I'm going to do it this way because of too many words. I can't do it on the email. I just don't have the time. Uh, I was thinking about doing it, but I just uh, can't get there. It's too much to talk about, and I don't really want to talk about it. It sounds too much like a judgmental thing, but I'm going to offer some guidelines. Uh, and I'll just name the, uh, so you know I'm talking about which site it is. It's the MER site. And to my knowledge, his policy conversation was fine enough. Uh, I I don't have a problem with what he was saying there. In fact, a lot of people should learn on that video uh, on the very nubbins of what is being what's happening there i think he's pretty accurate my question is is what was the question of of, of the point in the beginning and then i looked now this respectability who would walk into a government building and want to talk and, and think it's quite fine to interrupt the, the what needs to happen there with a cell phone that a sign saying we don't we don't we prohibit cell phone use and if you're talking on a phone you're going to be pulled out of line so you can go have your conversation somewhere else what the original poster of that was doing for an audit is really beyond me to understand. It was respectful to not use a cell phone. Apparently, it's so bad a problem, they had to post a sign. Now, let me move into what the in- interpretation of that was. The answer was given, and it was given in the other vi- another video I found about the schools not being regular public forums. That video, he was right on as well. So these are two pluses for that that account. Uh, I thought he actually, his best video is that school issue where he correctly identifies that the school official's not wrong while being harangued by someone who wants to do a constitutional audit about how much of the Constitution he knows and how much he's going to impose on this guy. And the, and the, 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 uh, the guy who's picking up signs was exactly explaining the condition and reiterated by the by the YouTube poster, the MER account. I, I that was probably like I said his best his best interpretation. That's exactly the the restrictions that are on all of this. It's exactly how you have to address it. If a restriction interferes with your rights, they're presumed to be correct. And if it's not, it's up to you to assert how, why, where you have the authority. Uh, to to do this, and what I'm talking about, folks, was a school official picking up signs that apparently delineated a free speech zone on a school. And everybody goes, oh, oh we got to have free speech zones. Oh, that's an abomination to free speech. Well, you got to look at the rules and how this all works, and the and why there's an underlying why, and another one comes, another reason why came at the end of the video. Let's just le- le- talk about your voting. Uh, some of these places, uh, the schools are actually voting centers. There are laws against lobbying for while the vote is that if you're going to go there, you're having to, they have time, place, and manner restrictions because they can't lobby for a vote. I don't, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm saying some, there's some places uh, that have a certain footage displacement away from a, a voting entry. Uh, so that's a, a, a reason that popped up. But in the free speech side, these time, place, manner, and he said it, if you have a res- problem with this restriction, go work with the administrator to free that up for you. And likewise, in the building in the office, uh, the question was about the cell phone. I was a little concerned. What was the question? If it had to do with him trying to use the cell phone for a camera and not the cell phone, well, the sign didn't speak to that. The question wouldn't have been 
how much he's going to be on video to try and catch them in an audit problem. It would be to simply shut the camera off unless you want evidence. Go to the supervisor and say, did you, does this use of the cell phone intend to stop my ability to film and not use the phone but the camera? And then make the comment. Don't make a big deal about it. Then make a comment. Say, well, I'm going to memorialize this conversation in a letter so I can work toward the evidence to bring this question into court. That I don't believe that you have the right to interfere with my First Amendment right to film in a public place, even though it's attached to a phone while I'm not using the phone. I would do this in paper. I wouldn't do this on film if I was truly interested to try and find uh, or uh, keep the right to do things in the place. I don't think... I'm not in agreement with MER account that this is these guys are expanding the right. The right's out there. The right's as expanded as it's going to be. It's whether or not you can uh, overcome the re, uh, uh, reasonable, and that's the question, the reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And those are kind of built out of what? You can't, under the First Amendment, you're not supposed to walk into a theater and yell and scream fire, are you? There's reasons why there's some restrictions. The idiots used to do that. And so what the remedy is, is you say, no, you don't have that right of free speech. And when you did that and people got hurt, you became liable. This is how we're going to set this up to do that. Otherwise, he goes in, screams liable, uh, screams fire. Everyone runs around, gets broken legs, killed, whatever, stomped, trampled. And there's no way actually to justify going after anybody unless you want to go back to lynch mobs. I guess that could happen. And so getting back to the MER account, uh, I don't have a... For those that don't know better, I think he's generally okay. I did not agree with his that it was sufficient what he talked about regarding the uh, USC's the Uniform uh, United States Code as distinct and the different purpose between that and the CFRs, the, the Code of Federal Regulations. He doesn't truly understand that. In, in a nutshell, I'll just give you the answer that would start a better conversation is that the the code, the United States Code, is enacted by Congress, and the rule, the regulation, the CFR, is the rules promulgated to enable that code. And so you've heard me talk about this, like when we're doing the miners and the permits. When you look at the permit that's required for mining, they say is required for mining, it doesn't apply to a granted mineral entry. It only applies to a project, plan, or demonstration, or some leasable, sellable mineral. And when you look at what the the law, the USC, that Congress made for that is, it tells you what the rule, how the rule applies. And when they, then that identifies and informs you how the agency is identi- is wrongly using the implemented, implementation of that code. And I, I simply, if I've, you've heard my 3809s, You simply just go to the text of the rule itself, and it says its purpose and scope. And in this case, the 3809 on the BLM side permit, the purpose and scope is relevant to only four different types of property, which is an identifiable place. They're conservation areas, essentially. And so if you don't have a a mine uh, claim in those areas, then it doesn't apply. Pretty simple. So when they come and apply it to you, the answer isn't to go down with your phone and your video and, and just and rail on them that it's not right. No, you have to make the record uh, uh, back to them that they're misapplying the code and show how they're misapplying it and then show the other side, which is you have a granted property that is not subject to this rule, this promulgated rule, not the enacted law, the promulgated rule. Inside the promulgated rule, inside its proper application, is the reasonable interference st- standards, the reasonableness of it. Like I get into NEPA, that's a applicable, that's a supplemental code uh, that then implements rules. Th- that The standard there is practicable. Well, practicable has a legal significance, and if you miss it, you miss it, or you miss all the power. That puts the burden on the government to show they've done every possible thing everywhere they've looked at everything to avoid some, doing something to the environment of mankind, including his productive capacity. And so I approached the uh, pr- the premise a little different, and I guess that you were saying, now, uh, I, I, now I, moved on, I moved on to the, from Mark V over to, uh, I, I've been here uh, t- 2017, and thank you for your sub- continued support. I moved into that, to, uh, that, I, that it was stated that people don't understand me, 
is I uh, I've been trying to figure out what what people think about it, and they, they don't apparently the reflection is that they don't quite understand what I'm saying. I'm apparently moved down the road from where they are uh, quite a bit. I'm not trying to prove rights. I'm just asserting the rights I have or showing how in a government entity, agency, official, or employee is wrong if they're wrong in how they do what they do. And so if you don't go where reality is, you can't understand me. I'm not talking about esoteric, actually esoteric or, or mythological ideas. I'm talking about dealing with real people in the real world. And if that doesn't fit a lot of people's uh, perceptions, I believe they just tune out or they don't know what I'm under, they don't quite understand and they don't know the foundations from what I'm speaking. And maybe to my error, I, I really don't have the time in the day all day to on a broadcast to be here all day setting up the terminology before I even got talking. I rely on you to be interested enough to go and start peeling the books or, or the websites that you can trust. I mean, this is a big deal problem as well, but I just went again to the the normal dictionaries, and I can pull out enough to answer the question. And uh, to, to me, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean to go anymore. I've made my decisions on on uh, suffrage. I've made my decisions on the registration card. I've looked at what all that does. I've looked at the connections of the jurisdiction. I looked at it being a proof for residency, and the residency is a commerce connection. There's all that line that we get into driver's license. All this guy said, so I don't need it. I don't need that connection. Does that mean that as a, someone without the connection, I can't walk in in the law and impose the law on an official that's going to violate it or uh, really against me on what I'm doing in peaceful uh, compliance? And more particularly for what I talk about, the law of the land, the land itself. Okay, so it's all context-specific and, and case and fact-specific what I talk about. If you have nothing specific relative to how I would approach it, I will make probably no sense to really anybody. It sounds like it makes sense to a lot of people, but it makes no actual sense because you can't apply it. That's why I have real trouble with what I do. I didn't realize that was going to be kind of a problem. I thought everyone was kind of on board, but uh, that's really becoming more of a point. And I appreciate hearing that people don't understand what I'm saying. I don't know. I'm going to have to work on how to solve that, but part of that is everybody else has to pitch in and help. Like I went through the word definitions. Get that understood. Now go to apply it particularly. Don't just leave it out there if you're not if you're and if you're not interested, don't waste your time on it. It's just a it'll it'll fulfill more comprehensive understanding, but it's not what you're after at this point. If you have a real problem like with a cop, well, let me let me say, put it in context. I don't know. Uh, I don't have much example. I don't like critiquing this way. I don't like coming in and kind of armchair quarterbacking this. It's easy to do in a way, but if you don't, it has a it has a foundation. Uh, that one officer or the whoever the official was in the school, I wouldn't even ask that set of questions. Like I said, I would, I, if the guy gave me some answers, I'd be taking notes like an investigative reporter. I'd go find his supervisor. I'd say I was, uh, if, if you want, and I've, I've had this other thing came up as well. If you don't know the source of the law, go ask. Don't go in like you know. In other words, let's go back to the office. I can go to the office where they were saying that don't use a cell phone. Don't talk in line. Don't use a cell phone when you come to the desk. we got business here to do. It's your business. It's the people's business. That's what we're here to do. Uh, we don't want you to use cell phones. I'm not going to extend it to the camera, just the cell phone. If you can't understand that, then you got, you're got you miswired to begin with. But if it looked, let's attach it now to the cell phone as a camera, not a cell phone. My question would be, where's the supervisor? I'd get the supervisor. If that wasn't available, I'd try to answer very quickly what the problem was, and I, my question would be, what is your authority? Don't say you don't have the authority or you have to do certain things. Ask, what authority are you allowed to post that? What's the authority? Tell me what you work through. You want to work from what their understanding is, and then you go research it, and I'm in agreement with the MER account, to the statutes. Don't invent reality. That's what they work from. And if that rule, like I said, you just get it down, you memorialize it in a simple letter, don't have to make any threats, and you make a record. You don't get in everybody's face and try to tell them what the world's about. It, it doesn't work that way. And, and i got to say that, that, that one school administrator was answering uh, to his credit, absolutely to his credit, right on, right on. And you could learn a lot from what, his, what you could hear underneath the, the barking dog yakking of the, uh, of the auditor. Uh, you could hear what you have to do, and he was instructing somebody what to do, and that person wasn't hearing it. And you have a right to assert 
you have to identify the right to know that you have to understand how to correctly identify what's going on and what has been said before what has been agreed to before whether or not you agree to it sometimes that's how you make the new uh, the new inroad is you identify the error and so uh, you have to reduce it down to a formalized approach you just can't throw yourself at the world and tell everybody how the world is i don't if someone tried to do that to me, I wouldn't give them two seconds. Just get out of my face. You're wasting my time. I don't need, I have the right to not listen to this as well. You have the right of free speech. I have the right to of freedom from association. Thank you very much. I mean, if that's what we're going to do, but that's not how it applies anyway. The point is, is that you don't impose yourself on what you think you know on people. If there, you have a right and you have a something that's an interest, anything. Like I tell you, the felony statutes pop right up here. If I have someone that's an official coming under a color of office or uses uses an official uh, uh, excuse that interferes with something I know I can prove without a question and not by my opinion, but because it's recognized by the power, whether that be a conquested or an occupying power or just a de jure government, whether or not I know without question I can assert that was being interfered with, infringed, imposed, prohibited, obstructed, whatever you want to use. I set I set the official up for a felony. I don't mess around with telling them how much the rights are and do you understand the Constitution. Forget all that. It's nonsense. And because I guess I speak this way, and because I don't go through all the rigmarole that everyone expects to see to prove they have rights, which I am beyond, uh, people may not understand this. I'm literally beyond that. I don't need to prove it. I have a base of knowledge that's supported foundationally, not by opinion, by what I'm going to be walking into when I walk into a battlefield. Not that I'm looking for a battle. I'm prepared for one. And so the MER, I was, uh, I'm neutral on it. I, I think people can get more information from him than not. I'll just put it that way. I don't totally agree with what he said on some things. I don't, wouldn't state it that way. I wouldn't not support some of it, like his referencing to the CFR or USC distinction. Uh, they're real simple. It's just uh, the USC again. The USC is the enactment of Congress for law, and the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, is the rule implementing that law. And it's specific to something, and you got to read about that. You can't make it up. You, you, you just It's just literal. It's not really that big. This is not that difficult. We make it difficult because we think there's a, bit, a bigger deal going on, and we don't understand the basics. And I'm trying to stay away from understanding the corruption that y'all knows there. That's what you're being treated by, and that's how you're responding. But that's not what you're coming at it with. You're coming at it some other way uh, on your indignation of what you found, not how it got here and how to address it. Not dress it, address it. And so how, as I told, uh, we we'll move into that. These decisions, these justices, how do you press, how do you press, how do you press? Sometimes you have to press and you have to press continuously. And you only get the rights that you're supposed to, uh, that you could assert. You're not going to get your opinion asserted. That's not going to happen. One example of someone who, uh, I mean, my hat's really off to, off to him, whatever my uh, settled problems with whatever has happened and how the occasion of, of it is, his father led this. His father is a guidance to a lot of people. If you just listen to what was going on, uh, they don't seem to show up very well in the in the courts, and they get beat down. Now we're talking corruption. But I told you about the Wayne Hage uh, Jr. condition, uh, and I told you the justices were having problems with that case. That I told you that they were looking at the inev the inevitable consequence of law being a pretense. The, the legal being a pretense for the law and that ultimately the property owner is be staring at you naked with all the rights in the property and still not being able to get to that is an indictment on the system. And, uh, and they don't have a clue about this, that, that I told you those justices in the Ninth Circuit were pushing for mediation. Then they questioned whether or not the mediator would be capable. And then they questioned or not whether a judge would be available, uh, would be knowledgeable. Well, I, we know that the judges won't be by another judge a long time ago. Lindley told us that about mining. Most all, by, by 1920 or so, most 28, whatever, most mining questions had been resolved. And there wasn't enough business for attorneys to be knowledgeable in mining law. There was only some few remaining judges who had experience in the past cases dealing with these cases, but they were no longer the same. And this is before the administration of the bureaucrats, bureaucrats. 
that he said then that he looks into the future and, and fears for the minor and their property rights because there's not going to be anybody of knowledge in the legal system. That's what we're suffering today. That's what Wayne Hage suffered. I can look through and see their problem. What did I tell you they would do? They're pushing for for mediation. That's exactly what the decision comes down. i got a link for you to read. It's kind of a little bit obscure. It goes through a, re, a good tale of what happened on the video I suggested you go listen to. Uh, and so that's good for this. A bit. You can read it now if you didn't want to go watch an hour and a half or so of a, of a hearing. Uh, very informative. But the man, uh, Hage, has the rights. He's got the property. He's got the water. He has a half a mile easement across uh, across that uh, either side of that water easement. He's got a 90 mile long easement going to one water source, and the court comes back and does not assert uh, assert his rights and says they want him to go to mediation. Is not justice. And I think we're looking at a time that there's people that any one of you can do this. You will stand up against this, and you will stand there naked with all the rights and all the property, and still not enjoy it. And you will then be then you become the example. That these judges are referring this case to mediation is not justice. It's certainly another bre more breath air. It's just a delay. This is an injustice on his rights. But at least he gets to go one more further step. These judges and justices don't even know what to do here. I think this is discussed after the introductions in this roundtable meeting. This thing is handled in five to ten minutes. But they're going to kick the can down the road. That's the injustice. They actually said he should be suing the government. But here's his problem. I think I think his problem was the court that he went to. He went to the takings court instead of going to the equity court. And a lot of you may not understand the distinction, uh, but that would be where you go to enjoin. That's where you go to get clarity on the law, what the law should have said. You can reform the law that it's supposed to be, state it better so it's clearly understood. You go for the rights that are being violated. You don't try to sue them for takings on the property value that the government itself does no longer want to recognize, notwithstanding it exists. And so my uh, um, where I'm connecting this is, do you go into that system thinking of the way it ought to be, or do you go in there and you battle them on what the impositions of the occupier now, the, even the bald and naked, bare ignorance of the case right now? So I want to actually use this as a, this guy, Wayne Hage Jr., is taking up the, the, the mantle of his father. Uh, and this was on a private attack from the government against him. And the court came back and said, well, you have all the rights, but we want you to go mediate with the government. Because they claimed there was some outstanding questions. Those were a lie. And this is, and he, and the, my, my, my problem, my criticism of, of Wayne Hage Jr. was he didn't identify that there was a lie. And so, uh, not with, notwithstanding the, uh, what looks to be, though, an apparent victory is someone standing on the rights the way you have to. I guess is my point here. And he's, I'm still standing. I think that was a song, wasn't it? That's the problem of the, of this country today. You have to be the one that's still standing. The Bundys, if he does it correctly, he'll be the last one. He becomes the example of how the system did it wrong. We're so far down the track of the occupied, uh, country becoming conquested, we don't even know how to properly be the so-called victim showing the occupier up. And we give in by actually doing these other things like First Amendment audits without without the substance behind it. And and the Mer, Mer account, MER account, uh, he points this out fairly good. I mean, it's all, like I said, I'm a neutral to that. I think you'll, you'll learn more from him from than from the auditor. Uh, who is really doing it incorrectly. There's no standard. I keep saying you had to go to the standard, like the DAPL, the, the, uh, the, the Indians with the with the uh, the, the pipeline. That, that's a process there, folks. They have a process. If you don't follow that, you don't, you don't speak to the power the way the power will be functioning. You're, you're not, it's not going to work. And all you're doing is you're wasting everybody's time and becoming an annoyance. And it all depends on whether or not they keep putting up with you. And, yes, you learn enough not to get arrested, or if you get arrested, you're satisfied with that because you just got a brownie point or something. I, I don't know. I don't know what function that is. But uh, but now, and then you go on to do it another day, and that's a big deal, I guess. But that, I'll tell you, that's not, not happening where you need to get things done. You need to be the guy that's standing there with all the actual property rights and the and the authority who's looking at themselves can't figure that out and knows there's a problem. Why? Because you've got all the power and you aren't being enjoying it. Why? Because the bottom line is that you were right in the Constitution. Wrong that the government gave you anything 
and misinterpreted secure and didn't understand it was to protect. And what you're looking at in Hage is the lack of protection notwithstanding his grants. They all acknowledge it's there, and now they want to go to the media, mediation. What is that, folks? What is mediation? I've talked about all this stuff over and over. Isn't that alternative dispute resolution? Isn't that the method that they destroy us with? This is the consensus process, the stuff we sued in 2013 and got that all-important default judgment that you heard in the very beginning of this broadcast under suffrage uh, would be uh, binding, right? As you said uh, also before I've told you. This is the system we're actually in. Uh, most people won't even address, know to address it. They, they, they're fighting their internal, their internal problem with what they see versus what they thought. And they're trying to impose their reality upon upon their thoughts and myths about it, upon a reality. Whether or not you call it conquest, occupation, just a screwed up system, just a bunch of criminals, cockistocracy, whatever label you put on it, it's not functioning. It's not functioning, and we see the example in Wayne Hage Jr. And I uh, told you that's what the, the they would go out there because they don't have a better thought, and that's exactly what the uh, the justices, so-called justices, of a court that's not even competent over the matter also, folks. This is the other thing that galls me. Uh, but they are recognizing that they are not capable to issue the equity orders in order to solve this in a few seconds, literally. It's just the time it takes to write it out. And so this, this is the kind of things I want people to step up into not showing how tough you are against a listen there's an evidence to show the cops don't have a limit i understand that let's move beyond it if you're going to go do that and they're actually actually stifling the 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 standard uh go after that that's what we need to do we need it and there's millions of us if you think this war this battle needs the second amendment you're nuts what it needs is knowledge it needs in, it needs an intelligence it needs a rational thought and it needs to be applied it needs a, an evolutionary engagement not not this pseudo fabricated look at me with a camera stuff i mean i appreciate some of it but i really really irritates me uh, and then I noticed, I noticed too, like uh, this broadcast, the MER account doesn't have very many views. And I would have to say I would listen to that information if I had time. I don't have the time. I got through a few that I thought were interesting. Uh, and he made enough, um, uh, dis there's enough distance between me and how I would interpret it from him that I probably wouldn't take a lot more time. Uh, on that, but for someone who is going to make the mistakes I heard of the First Amendment auditor make, no, that guy, MER account is what they need to start listening to and actually start to apply in the minimum. In the minimum. And then maybe they'll start to understand now that they look at there has to be a rational basis for the assertion of the right that the, within the context of a constitutional parameter that was, that was, uh, uh, extraneously obstructed or impaired, then now they'll come to me and maybe they start to understand what I'm talking about on how you affect that. And uh, so I mean, I'll just keep moving on. Uh, law enforcement uh, has been abusing an unconstitutional law to arrest people for trying to file complaints. And this, to me, was the First Amendment audit thing, why these people are getting arrested too and all these things started to be tied together. We see it in Louisiana. It's really all over, folks. But I think it happens this way because of most of all y'all don't understand about the uh, investigative reporter making a record, getting it notated properly. Don't impose your beliefs. Go to the thing that's uh, the, the, the statutes that are already written that they have to follow. Then bring your right in where they constrained or impaired it unlawfully. And not do it as a as a lawsuit, like a common law lawsuit. You bring it as an equity action where they can't answer against it. And you too might have a default judgment, but more importantly, you get to come in with the power of the court on contempt in the future, which we don't have as a common law or trying to show that they're doing criminal activity. And Rico's too far here, but Louisiana enforcement has been given, I think, on this report, two federal judges. I'm not going to even worry about their, their, their competency. Everyone believes that they're, they're valid. That's good enough for me. I'll, I'll find the battlefield as I see it. I won't change much if I don't need to. Just get after what I do need to. 
uh, that the they are using pretextual stops and the int- intricacies of an application to go after people that are trying to file complaints against their harangue, their the government official uh, violations in, uh, of them. They g- get into uh, you get into say, well, I'm going to file a complaint. I want to hear your supervisor, and they then they throw a you know, that looks like contempt of cop, and so they throw on you uh, an abuse condition, assaulting an officer charge for claiming that you would uh, com- dare complain against them. Well, the, constitu- uh, the, the, the courts are pretty clear on this one. You just got to read it, read it up. I'll give you a link from Tector. You can read a little bit about it. You can track this down if you want. If you want to be someone that starts to assert this more correctly, at least the way I perceive, there's already been two court cases. In those areas, they've been given notice, and they continue. Now you know this. You don't even have to be one who was assaulted. You just know that this is a pattern of activity. Now we start to talk more closer to the RICO part, but what you're after is to get the court orders to be imposed. And so you move an equity action that, based on their history and their continuation of doing what they're violated and the lack of the enforcement, that you are suing to protect you, protect you. Isn't that what the courts are set up to do? Not to give you anything to protect you, give you a place to do, an objective place, supposedly, to affect the protection. And you bring the equity side up in this case. Doesn't seem to be a, a, a bad thing that once you start to do it that way, I believe they will stop in the future. Why? Because if they don't, they get hit with a contempt charge by the court judge itself, who will not take it on the on the on their face, very on, on, in their psyche, very well. Their judicial orders are being disregarded. The very thing that the three justices in the Wade Hage case on the Court of Appeals could not understand and were were um, um, insulted uh, that the agency wouldn't listen to what they had said. Now you get on that side, and you're still inside that system doing that system. But you get on that side now, it starts to work with you. Why would you not want to do that? Not sue, don't sue them in law for the harm and repair my broken arm. No, you sue for them violating two federal court orders that said they weren't supposed to do this other act at all. I'll lick my wounds on the broken arm, but I'm going to get you an equity for the compensation for failing to uphold your duty to the law and a court order. And if you continue to do it, I'm going to petition the court for contempt. Let him let let the judge deal with that. So I don't know that everything's set and done here. I think we're just not doing enough, and you got to look far enough into the future that if you really want to do something, doing any kind of a check or getting insulted by any governmental official, go find out, ask them, ask them where they think they get their authority. You then go look at those code statutes. It's all regulated out. You just go read it. Go find out if it's applicable, and then go look and see if it even if the if the subject matter had the purpose and scope, and if it didn't, he's they're out out of the scope right there. They're out of the purpose right there. If it is within the scope of purpose, then you analyze whether or not you're right extended there, and that's the reasonable standard. That's almost an administrative side judicial interpretation, the reasonable standard. And you got to look at what the standards are so you can meet them. Remember, probable cause that's to get the citation beyond a reasonable doubt is to get the conviction. Different standards. I'm not saying I agree with any of them. I'm saying that's what they are. And so this seemed to me, uh, for those of you in Louisiana, Louisiana, be careful because they figured they, they think they've got this figured out and they're thumbing their nose at federal court orders, but you have two of them. And you could feel fear for your life based on their actions to violate federal law, federal court orders violating. You've got to go into their case and see how they did it. And you can say that they're using this as a pretext, just like this article says, and you bring it in to enjoin them to protect you and those similarly situated and for future protection by contempt of court. You tell the court right up front what you do. You demand that they do it based on this this activity. Now, they may give you some stink about it being prospective relief, but then you realize, go research that. You find out how that works, too. But at least, at least you got it on record. You tried on top of that, and then when they come and do it, they'll well, first of all they won't come and do it to you now. You are on record, uh, but if they do do it now, you got the pre-record that the, you've you've settled the whole thing, don't you? That's why they won't come after you too. Second point. But we're not doing enough, and I'm not saying be lawsuit happy, 
I'm saying you you do it administratively. You write your letters. You get the facts. You don't impose upon them. You don't say if you don't answer me in 30 days that 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 you will take it as a lien against them. Stop that nonsense. That's not how all this works. You will get the ability to rely upon the failure to disclose as either a failure of authority or an omission, which is fraudulent and now criminal. As I start to bring out the statutes that I would bring to somebody who is doing this. Where do you find that? You go to your statutes, your state codes, your state statutes, your federal law, whatever whatever one you want, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. It's all written down. If someone has an, a direct a, a delegation of authority to honor that by their employment contract or their oath, you got them once you develop that duty. You have to state that as a fact. This is not that hard. So uh, going around with a camera, it's not going to do anything. Getting in the face of cops who should have actually something better to do. Getting in the face of a clerk who's just trying to run your business through uh, recording stuff because you gotta you got to argue with someone over the reasonableness of having a sign that you that tells you not to speak on the cell phone in the building when you're right there in line uh, or doing business with a clerk. It's just uh, uh, just epitome of disrespect anyway. What happened to all that? I mean, there used to be a thing where you looked around and you had a look you had some respect for people there that you didn't intrude upon them you respected like everywhere you went no matter if it was public what do they do here do i want like a library folks i mean been to a library lately but i mean isn't it you walk in and you're quiet you understand there's people doing studious work at least where they used to be you don't walk in there and start yelling and screaming and talking on the phone real loud when you walk into a library. Why would you even have to put a sign? They have to put a sign means you're looking at a society that's really gotten dumb. You really got some trouble. Why you'd argue over that, I don't get. So that I'm not going to get lost in that one. Just keep going. Lots to I, So much to talk about, folks. I'm really overwhelmed uh, with all of it. Uh, just so much we could talk about. So much uh, to, to, to dive into. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter if no one's really working. And those of you that are, you you do it. See, you, you just, I've noticed it. You jump in, we'll talk a little bit or write or have a conversation a little bit, and then you're gone. You're doing your thing. I see work pop up here and there. It all seems really, really on point, which I'm always fascinated. I kind of laugh, I chuckle, not laugh, I chuckle about how really simple it is when you focus on things. Stop doing the uh, ADHD or the uh, what, attention def deficit syndrome, whatever the heck. Focus on some stuff, folks. A federal court, you want to talk about regulation, you want to talk about rules, you want to talk about how it works. This story is not, I'm not putting this out to I agree with it, because I believe that we are not quite understanding what's going on. And we can, again, tell the world what we think we see and how we believe it is. And this is what this title seems to say to me. To me, I read it because it's something to give you, but if you look inside the conversation, realize that there's a whole bunch of interesting things, given that you focus on this subject, which we've talked about, that may just maybe it gives you some insight on how you're going to deal with it or something to avoid not fight that fight yet or develop more terrain a more foundation more for fortifications for making the fight in the future given you focus on it federal court proves government loyalty to big pharma rules cbd has no medical value now, this one also has a lawyer's twist and a torment in this rule uh, where they say, well, this was just an adjustment, a, a clarification. you got to go start looking at the standards and statuses of these as well when you get involved with this. But an interesting statement in, in all the criticism here, and this is, again, uh, a free thought project. I appreciate what they put out. In this case, I don't think the attitude's quite right. It lays it out here about the fact that the CBD now has been clarified to being it's a product of uh, marijuana, that it's on the cannabinol, cannabinoid list. All right Now, we also know that that's not a psychoactive uh, type of thing. Now, that means that we may have a, we may have a standard uh, and we have some research to go find that shows that shows something a little differently and move this through the administrative side. But one interesting point I think was missed in all this. Notwithstanding what it all says and how they go through it, there's a hemp industry, and hemp is not, uh, it's got a small amount of THC, not a great amount. That is defined in a law. And I thought what they're missing here is very interesting and where someone who is interested in this has an answer potentially 
where the people who lost against the DEA's rulemaking of this on the clarity of the rule, the court came back and said this, which I thought was fascinating, and unless I have this completely misunderstood, uh, this looked like the way to go, not another complaint, not even appealing the decision, but actually getting the clarity written in a, in, in a law. And I said, declare the law here. They're afraid that there's going to be a misinterpretation between the Schedule 1 listing on the DEA side versus this bill called the, the Agriculture Act of uh, 2014 or the Farm Bill. Because in the Farm Bill, said the court said the rule was not in violation of the Agricultural Act of 2014 Farm Bill, which contained industrial hemp provisions that defined hemp as cannabis sativa L plants with less than 0.3% concentration of psychoactive THC. The Agricultural Act contemplates potential conflict between the Controlled Substances Act and preempts it, the judges wrote. Well, that's in bold. Well, now, I don't know about you folks. Let me listen. Let me read that. The Agricultural Act contemplates the potential conflict between the Controlled Substances Act which says that a cannabis CBD oil is is a byproduct, but it preempts that, doesn't that mean that it eliminates that Class 1 schedule? Now, if you think that, I would think that. But here's the question. You don't want to risk your life on this, go put in a cage. This is exactly what the declaratory judgment tool is made for. I would take that statement from that judge instead of making all the time to appeal like the, like the attorneys might want to. And I don't, I'm not going to dis, disregard what they might want to do. Maybe it's important what they do. But to me, I just want to get to the fact of getting this byproduct of hemp identified as being underneath the Farm Act, the, our, our, the Farm Bill, the Agricultural Act, wouldn't I? And we could go to another judge on a declaratory judgment on my rights, your rights, to declare, and for those similarly situated, to declare that this is not actionable because of the preemption of the Farm Bill. And I'm just talking off the top of my head without reading any of it. I'm pointing out how you go into the system and how you look at it till you get out what you need that's there. That I suppose, if you looked under the bill, there's also going to be rules here. The CFRs will implement the C, uh, the uh, USC Farm Bill, and it may have how this is decided. And so you'd go find if it's not, then you also want to get the not just the fact that a CBD product coming from the hemp that's under the farm bill is not the regulated substance underneath the Control Substance Act and get a judge to declare it with their signature. When you do that, the declaratory action, they're going to, you don't have to, I don't think you have to notify anybody because it's your rights are being declared relative to law. If someone tried to join that, I'd, I'd be fighting them to try and join. Why? Because I don't want them interfering, having a say in my rights where they don't have a right. If a DEA shows up, I'm not talking about your DEA. I'm talking about the Farm Bill. That's not your jurisdiction. Get out of here. I'm not walking over the DA and screaming and yelling about how how this works or complaining about the, the judge said that it's uh, that the that the DEA rule of clarity is fine. No, 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 I've got to question it. It's a conundrum. It's a real problem. You delineate the problem. I now say, well, underneath this act, I get to do this. This product that we have, CBD, is not actually not actually underneath this act. This act, or not uh, under the DEA, this act uh, preempts it. We want it declared that it's safe to derive this CBD oil, notwithstanding the, uh, the, the listing, because of the farm bill. And see what the judge will go with. Do your best to go ahead and get that. That's a declaratory judgment. It's in the law. You gotta just go to the rules. You don't have to make any of this up. And if you did that, it's a whole lot better than complaining that you can't. Or the CBD oil people complaining, uh, arguing the wrong point about whether it's medicinal. See, that's irrelevant. It's just the fact of a byproduct that it comes out of the farm bill, given that it, there's a product more than fiber that can come from it. And if not, you try to then get it to include it. But why? Because there's no psychoactive or not appreciable enough psychoactive by law to find out a 0.3.3%. So you may have to bring a test that your stuff you grow is not underneath the DEA's requirements because it's underneath this preemption law. 
So did I, I hope I clarified that a bit. We look at these things and we go, oh, well, we could say all this stuff, big pharma, this and that. And the other big pharma has nothing to do this. Yes, there's something underneath the underside of this. But you have to understand how the rules are promulgated and you have to understand that we've come here this way. We've all allowed it to be this way that apparently now uh, the pharma only has to give, or any, any industry only has to give their uh, what appears to be objective testing. And that's sufficient. Now, we see the, da- the, the danger and the harm of all that, but we're not into engaging this as we're supposed to. As I've told you, we did, we've done quite a bit in the, uh, the, excuse me, the coordination principles with the United, with the Jefferson Mining District and, and writing, uh, writing, uh, comments, not comments, but asserting, uh, the, uh, the statement of balance between the law, the requirements, and the obligations and duties of government relative to property. And against the uh, environmental or adjective scientists who would claim that wildlife has more power uh, to destroy us. It just doesn't exist. And we get to say all that in a properly stated position reading those black and white things that the government agents have to follow. But this isn't about a federal court proves loyalty to Big Pharma. Obviously, the dis- there's one train of proof that could show there's a lot of, uh, a lot of conflict of interest. But this, this, this story actually shows that it looks like there's an answer. It has nothing to do with that. It has not, if it preempts it, it has nothing to do with the clarity either. And so you've got to properly frame what you're looking at. Not put, you impose your sense of the world, oh, that's a crime what they do. Yeah, it might be, but so how are you going to take the, the territory, the terrain, the battlefield as you find it and get it swung into the direction it's supposed to, it intended to be, I guess is another way to say it. And so, I, I don't know, our misperceptions lead us down. We frame these constraints incorrectly, and we're never going to respond correctly. There's just no way to start wrong and, and make it right. Uh, and, wow, I mean, uh, and our studies, what do we do? The studies that we have uh, and the science that we bring on, and no one does the backup studies, and, and you wait over time, and we get harmed by all this stuff, would have a, would have a, 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 a forum if properly presented. And what do we find? A new study, this has actually been since January, just getting it today, a new study links pet deaths and cancer to over-vaccinating. Over-vaccinating uh, these pets gives, in the place of injection, cancer. Vaccinated cats and dogs can cause a range of diseases and disorders, including autism. Veterinarians are often guilty of guilty of overprescribing vaccines to maximize profits, according to a new study published by the U.S. Veterinary Journal. So, at the site of injection, cats, for instance, who get injected in the leg or the tail, will develop cancer in the leg or the tail, and they will have to be amputated. So you can get this link, and we can make all the complaints. Uh, you can then jump to the point about, uh, oh, well, I'm not giving vaccinations. But remember, the real standard about vaccinations and use is, are you up against an illness that can kill you versus like the measles, which likelihood is not. And when you're up against that, this other thing, like let's put it in a context. I've had dogs that I saved from Parvo, but typically that's a killer. And this wasn't an easy thing to do, but it, I, I was able to say they got parvo before they got the they got the vaccine when they were really young. That's a killer. That I would have to say after, before uh, I would analyze the vaccine, the one that's needed for parvo, make sure it's a nice, a good one, not all this nonsense one. You know that they have different grades, and I would now know to go, and I would not not get the parvo vaccine for my dog. Now I, I I would I did save well I did I did herb I was like I was doing herbs at the time it was a lot of work I almost lost them and they were really in bad shape but that's one of those things they're up again they get par where they're gonna die most likely and that's not one I want I, I want to fight that's not the kind of thing I want to uh, I, I want to challenge challenge and lose my pet pet over and so there's this decision that has to be made. But the standard is use, uh, is it death? Are you going to get 
die. That's how they rate this thing. So if you don't come in and discuss this and look at it that way, you're going to just accept all these vaccines that are being marketed. Now, we do have a money and profit-driven thing that now a study tells you this over-vaccination is actually causing a problem. They say that the present practice, in quote, the present practice of marketing vaccinations for companion animals may constitute fraud by misrepresentation, fraud by silence, and theft by deception. Well, aren't they just talking coercion and extortion and all this stuff I talk about right there? And that's what that statement makes. And we say may, you'd have to come up with the proof. You'd at least, you have a dog that you had, a, or a cat, especially the cat with an amputated leg, and you find this out, and you go in and you sue the, the pharmaceutical, the vet, and all this other stuff. If you want to, to make the point, you got to be more honest about these things. I mean, for the for people, the flu for most people is not necessarily a death sentence. No, I don't know. That's up to you to gauge whether or not that could be your death sentence, because we also know that there's no proof, there's no guarantees. But this is the I want to say the the standard. So we come to the to the table. We just listen to this garbage about the promotions, and we hand over our authority, our responsibility, more more likely, to an expert's say, and the experts with a conscience are coming out and saying, no, what we've been saying, I've been killing my patients, and these are vets. And isn't this an interesting, uh, maybe not a proof, but isn't this an interesting way to get at the problem with people and vaccines? Remember we talked about the aluminum transport? If it depends on how much aluminum you put into a certain spot, a spot will depend on whether or not the body granulates the aluminum to protect the body from the amount of aluminum that was come in. And if it was a small amount, that nanoparticles could secret them way transparently to the body for the macrophage to be picked up and brought to the, through the blood brain barrier and put in certain spots in the brain, causing problems. You see how this now turns in an animal to cancer. This granulation, when they're giving, it's probably a good thing they've been given large doses. Otherwise, you'd have cats with more cats with autism, and you think it's just a dumb kitty, a dog that can't quite do a trick. Was that the dog you throw something and it lands on its nose, bounces, you can't catch a ball, it always lands on its forehead? Maybe that's a problem of vac- over vaccina- vaccination. But we have a story been from since January about injection site cancers. Public awareness of public notice, I suppose. Another Another type of injection site cancer uh, in the news. I've been talking about it the last few weeks, and it now occurs to me, folks, I hadn't really been picking up on the clue. As I told you, I don't talk about this too much, but all of a sudden, the last three weeks, I've been talking about it. And it has been really important. I just don't like get, I don't like getting in on the titles and, and, and working stuff over on calling people names. I, I want substance. And and so this is where I kept away from it. But in the last, last few weeks, of a month or more, it's really been come to the fore. We see the problems. Another injection site cancer. Uh, United States has been in the news. I want to move from here into this uh, this thing now. U.S. Embassy moves to Jerusalem has become a reality Monday. Uh, you've heard me speak about this. You've heard me tell you, show you where to go read to show that this Jerusalem, this city state, if you will, uh, is not uh, accessible to the current Israelis. It can't really be the the capital of Jerusalem the way they're form, they're fabricating it. Uh, these are lies, and they're using lies to bring forward. I was saying last week the deceivers deceiving, deceive, uh, deceptively deceiving you. So this is what the lie is, and this is where we get start getting a problem that we're over. I said we got to call this lie out. This is now becoming I mean more apparent to me as I've gone back through some emails and started to find out. I didn't read the email. I got to him late. I was overwhelmed, but people are coming, commenting to me about this information that they're being given that aware, shifts their awareness, but that they see this has all been a lie and a deception. This is what I've been speaking to. Uh, that it's. I think it's now a consciousness thing. I'm gonna. I don't know how many much more I'm gonna talk about it because I think it's pretty well. You either get this one how wrong this is, and we need to start working, commenting about the wrongness of it. Or it's going to happen and we're going to see more and more things and you will be affected at some point in the future, one way or the other. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but this is a thing. U.S. becomes a, U.S. Embassy moves its embassy to Jerusalem. That triggered some, uh, third, some, uh, Central American countries to do the same. This is how happening. But the UN has said this is null and void uh, as well. So now we see a non-state who's known international occupier called Israel 
uh, trying to move in to make a, a split a, a city state, make it their own. United States bully is moving its embassies. This is all important stuff. Uh, international law. Uh, embassies are starting to recognize this. Recognition is all important. Uh, this is why it's very important to withhold recognition at, at all if you're not uh, cons uh, if you're not certain. Uh, that's why recognitions. They're always looking for recognition because under international law, it only takes two witnesses to make the fact of its existence, and then it's pretty difficult to undo it. It's not impossible, but pretty difficult. That, that uh, this whole thing is destabilizing the, the the Jerusalem area. They're injecting a cancer into Jerusalem. I found out in doing some research where I thought I said let's let's move uh, the current state of Israel over to Baja. It, it give them three times the, the three times the power of the land. They'd be isolated like they want to be. They'd still be in the armpit of the United States. We could remove their nukes. There would be no attack. Uh, why don't we do that? I thought we were going to have to break the dome of the rock. And I just found out we don't have to break the Dome of the Rock. The Israelis actually want to destroy the Dome of the Rock. I, I was mis, I was misunderstanding that. I said, so that's one logistical detail we don't have to worry about. The Israel, current Zionist p political movement has no valid right there. And the reason why it's still considered an occupier is because they can't prove a valid right. Uh, I've been through this last three or four weeks. I've talked about it a little bit lower through uh, before. I've gone through some of the definitional bases. Uh, in fact, I think Gary L sent me a link to some uh, somebody who is also talking about this, and pretty much uh, he has a extra information than what I did. But we can generally concur about the uh, the unlawfulness of this uh, this whole condition. Uh, the that um, I don't remember now the. I'm sorry. The name of his uh, Black Blackstone Intelligence, I think. Uh, we the Israel. Uh, I call it the is now. I'm calling it the Israel lie, uh, the Israeli lie. The, there you saw the run up to Netanyahu and this Iran thing. Everything you're watching is a lie. Everything you're watching, it's moving this through is deception, uh, and it has no basis in anything except the fact of its sheer power to do so. And I guess this is just another, this is like a horde moving in. Uh, the rightful people that could prove, and I'm not at all saying that there's some people that would call themselves Jewish that have a right, that don't have a right there, as we've talked about, but it's a very narrow place, and it responds to the 12 tribes of Judah, Judah being one of the tribes. One. And we may have a contention between Blackstone, uh, the guy who does, like Jake, and myself on where Jerusalem was. On my map, that I, the maps I found said Jerusalem was in Benjamin. It wasn't in Judah. He said it was in Jerusalem, but then he said it was attached to the state when Judah attached to Benjamin together. And so I'm going to hold to mine. It doesn't matter, neither here nor there. It wasn't just to the Jews. It wasn't certainly to the Israelis. They didn't exist, folks. And I think Jake goes through an interesting statement to show you year by year how it, if it existed, it only existed for a little bitty time and could not. The deception is, as Netanyahu would tell you, its authorities of right go back 3,000 years. Absolutely a lie. Absolutely a deception. But what's been wearing on me, weighing on me terribly, is, is what these deception cause us to do. And where have we been told about watching out the rule? You want to talk about definitions? And you knows them when you sees them and all this kind of stuff we talk about when I get into the military occupations and the militarization and how the world works through this whole aspect. This is how things get, this is the power and the violence that brings things about that we have to resist uh, is to call out deception. But the, what's the ramification of what's going on is the unrest that's being developed. It's all for Netanyahu's lie. You saw Trump actually accede to his authority, uh, to Netanyahu's so-called proof, without proof. You saw Trump do the same thing to May and the Skirpal case. He did the same thing to the chemical attack with uh, Macron. He just takes their word for it. Folks, I don't even have you take my word for it. I tell you all the time, go do the research. Go build your case for yourself in the way that it's laid out. But this is what Trump does. Some comment was made that he... He went. He swung to neocon. He's never converted, folks. He's always been. We identified this long ago. He's always been a supporter of this fraudulent, deceptive condition. This injection site cancer in the Middle East. And I, my problem here is that we're talking about now the deeper sense of what's going on. 
We're not just talking about some war. We're not about fighting all this other stuff on just some people. No, this is now touching the big, the, the, the underside play, the underside players that are in on this problem. And you're going to start to see the next deeper section that I'm, I've really been troubled with. Uh, Americans uh, should ask themselves, do I want to die for Israel? I thought it was a very interesting statement to ask, and I know parts of why you would ask this question right now. You want to warn people off, but I'm going to tell you this is warning you of the truth. you got to ask yourself, why is it we are fighting for something that nobody wants? Why are we invading foreign lands and having? Uh, why are we lying to be there? Remember the master, weapons of mass destruction lies. All lies, deception, and fraud. And so what has been weighing on me about this? Well, we're told, remember, it's about your deeds and deed. Uh, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. You get that right in the Libra Code. If you didn't know it's international law, you can take this to the bank. I don't care if it's the bankster, the real bank. I don't care if it's a or, or, or bank. I don't care what it is. You take this one to the bank. But you know them when you see them, folks. You know them when they in their deed, indeed. And so this, uh, I got an email, and I don't want to talk too much more about it. Information was coming to the emailer, uh, things that I was surprised that uh, were being informed that wasn't, weren't known by the emailer, uh, that I, I was surprised that the, they didn't know this. But inside the context, the spirit of what was moving in them was this uh, reorienting this whole condition that it's been a deception, uh, that it's implied in the spirit of the writing and the awareness being shifted, that uh, what I've been speaking to, we are being moved by deception. We're being moved by crime. We're acting at the instance and suggestion of criminals. Makes us an accessory, folks. And what I went to go back, I'd done some research about the children of Israel and the children of Satan. I talked about this. I already got a website, uh, Blogcaster links about this. You can prove this out and what happens about this. We're told in history what happens. This happens over and over. And it's going to happen until it's done. This happens over and over, that you will be met by deceivers and fraudsters. And where I finally found out what I had researched about this, you go to the Bible, it stated, and it just so happens to be on, on point of the party who this is, this is, this is imposed upon. Acts 13.10 uh, said, and said, you who are full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now, a lot of you would turn off and turn away when I talk about so-called religious matters. I look at this as a historic statement of condition. And I want to go to what's the deed indeed, full of deceit and fraud, that we are going to be making a crooked path away from the narrow path of our truth. I don't have to get all religious. This is what happens when a criminal is put in position and power and is allowed by everyone to continue. You become an accessory to that crime. But let me, I want to focus on deceit and fraud. Let me go back now in the last few weeks of what I've been talking about and highlighting for you the deceit, deception, the fraud in the presentation of the Iran nuclear nukes, the deceit and deception of mass de weapons of mass destruction, the deceit and deception of all these liars cavorting with liars, as I've said over the last few weeks, is the hallmark of a great swindle going on, and it's worse. Millions will die underneath this. Why? Because we're crickets to it. We don't uphold the principles. We don't even look without a religious sense and dis to destroy this in ourselves. And look, people who will deceive and cause fraud upon you by commission or by omission are our enemy. Let me put it in context. This was spoken to a Jewish magician who would, was spreading the word, the crooked word, the deceit and deception, which was getting in the way, that was convincing people to be not following a truth. And this is an example to me. You, it makes sense. If you, can't, you can't listen to someone who will deceive you and, fraud you and defraud you and expect to come out. Why are they doing it in the first place? But a darkness shall come over their sight. 
What is that? That's very coming you coming down down uh, as a shadow upon them. They don't have to get religious here. These are people that are doing it to you today. They're going to call your your sons and daughters up to go fight for this. Whether it goes nuclear is irrelevant. This this is a deception that's on the world right now, and it's going to get worse. It's going to come on us. We've been talking. We've been watching it. We're not we're not responding to it. And my. Uh, if, if I, what weighs on me is our lack of response to this deception and fraud. And I sense that if we don't see the deception and fraud that's this obvious, we're not watching it around us. We're not even seeing it in ourselves like a, the, uh, a First Amendment uh, auditor, so-called, railing against a court, uh, 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 a simple secretary or about a sign in a building. We don't recognize the, the, the fraud and our the deception in our own thinking. And that's our problem. So we got to find the first step of the problem. We are the first step of the problem. We, I don't, again, I don't, if we can't see by the fraud and deception that's going on in the actors of the world right now, that we're on the path of what we were told happened supposedly two or three thousand years ago, for those of you that will not agree at all, and you don't take wise counsel from hearing this, that these are the son of the devil, and then you find out who the children of the devil, the the the, the, the children of the devil are, and it happens to be one of the tribes. When you read enough, one of the tribes of Israel, the man, and the two grandsons he adopts, making twelve. One was considered the children of the devil, happens to be the same one that professes to be speaking today. But they don't even have that as a backup. That just happens to be what they're mimicking, as I told you last week. They do this very, very, very well. And if we can't get the responsibility in us to see that and just start to respond against it, we're going to succumb to deceit and fraud and the ways that are not righteous, as it says here. What have I been saying? The narrow path is the path of righteousness. What the righteousness I'm speaking to, because to me it's all beyond me. This is not a war for me. I have a choice to make. Do I just want to get on a narrow path of truth and justice, if you will, and just hold as dear as I can to that and understand that and be an example for the better way and just be that example? This this war that's bigger than us is bigger than us. I, I, there's nothing I can really do about that except to be the little example that I tried to be. That I am so, it's weighing so heavy on me those last few months. I, I think we're into that time. The deceivers and deception and the fraud is rampant and we're not stopping it. We're not calling it out. We're not calling it out in the first instance. We're not using techniques that have been used so effective against us. Uh, against those that are doing it. And, and that would be simply not calling them a name, uh, but but identifying a fact. And so, I guess that's, uh, I don't know what more to say. I'll, I'll insult more people if I get deeper into this. Uh, I'll um, maybe confuse some more people if I get more uh, into this. But we have to understand, and I, that's why I touch it very lightly, if we don't act against deception and fraud, and we identified that it's a deception and fraud, not because we believe so, but because they admit so. By the by, their by their action or inaction, their omission to say something that is relevant and material to a point, that then leads us to a false interpretation in the absence of that evidence. Then we get to call. Once we then they qualify from themselves, their record or the failure to make a record, we then can rely. We can't call them necessarily the liar and deceiver unless they've caused an harm. Then we have to call by the probable cause, remember, not to conviction. But we can rely on these things to then assert at least the beginnings of an allegation. If not, it's not a self-evident truth. That you're not going anywhere. I don't care about, forget the religious contention connotation here, the historic relevance, relevance. When you are dealing with someone that's deceitful and committing and defrauding you, your end cannot be correct. And so we going to not step up and, and hold the firm line on that. I don't know about us as a people. 
And that's the only reason why I'm touching this Israeli thing. It's, it's Israel lie. This whole thing has been a setup on but deceit, deception, fraud by a commission or omission. And I see everyone get wrapped up in names and calling and all this other nonsense that they lead you into conceptualizations. And then we all, we're all then pointed out that as we trigger people and cause these. It's not about all that. That's the division. As I've said before, identify the first point. If there's a deception, call it out there. Don't even, you don't even have to get involved with the discussion. I think I was talking with Vince or writing an email to Vince on a discussion he had on his broadcast. Ponder Gander, I think on what's Fridays? Anyway, it was a conversation he's discussing with people. I wouldn't even enter into the discussion. If you're going to talk about vilifying someone's property rights, in this case Bundy, you got to show me your title to that's being interfered with by his title. You can't go in on the weakness of someone else because he's not going to show you his title. You can't go on the proof of his failure to produce title as your title to say anything. We've missed this principle as well. In other words, going into a public building, where's your title to the building? It's a public building. It's a, not yours. It's like a it's like a highway. You have as much right as everyone else does. And you have regulations that are on the road. Like, don't do damage. How's that? Don't, don't be an interference. Don't be an obstruction. Don't be a nuisance. Those are just those are just respectful impositions. It's, it's not so complicated. It doesn't take a, 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 a rule to promulgate. It's just a function of of what the purpose of the use of the property is. And we were at one time respectful of that, like my library, uh, uh, my library reference. I don't know how long I've been doing libraries. You just now you just learn. Don't speak up. Don't make a nuisance of yourself. Let people study. Let them concentrate. Give them that place and all the noise of the society. Let them go to the library and, and, and figure things out of everything that's available to them that we have that we can bring together. Make that place that, that, that safe space. That, that hadn't up until recently been a problem. So I don't want to get too lost. I want to get stale. The most important point here, stop being deceived. Stop being led in by defrauded uh, defrauding. And if when you see it, you got to call it out. I don't care what your political thought is on this. I don't care what your leanings are. Uh, to me, they're all irrelevant. They're all a lie. And uh, you become, you're allowing that to, to be the excuse that lets you fall into be the accessory against the whole, uh, as a crime against everyone in the world. Because what the United States does is, re has global ramifications. If you understand the law, if you understand that and our liability, our responsibility uh, in what we do in the United States of America and the, our and the people here, what our effect in the world is through these criminals it is um, kind of awesome. And I don't say that in a good way. So thank you for being with me today. I hope something I said uh, opens up some doors, gets some clarity. I hope I answered the questions of the emailers. I hope that was uh, clear enough. And if not, email email at uh, Mark on the Beast at protonmail.com. Grimmer, thank you for what you do. Appreciate all that uh, you have there. Uh, remember now, Freedoms Network uh, again. Freedoms Network is going to need. It's going down in 13 days if we don't get enough uh, enough donations. That's that the servers need to be paid. And uh, I don't know if there's more coming in, but there it is. That's the notice to you. And uh, Jules over at ucy.tv, thank you very much for what you do. And all the other guys I was talking to, thank you for what you're reposting. And the mines, I don't know what's going on at mines since uh, they went to the tokenization. It, it's uh, not so good over there. I'm not sure what the deal is. I seem to be shadow banned in lots of places and don't know why. Maybe people just don't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe they don't understand how far down the road I am relative to actually uh, the evolutionary engagement on the ground, getting things done uh, to really to correct the things that are wrong not, and the important things, not the little, not the incidental stuff right now. I, I can let go a, a little bit here and there. And a lot of it's just uh, me looking around and being respectful and not trying to impose myself on lots of people. I, I think you feel the same way, and that's why you probably even listen to me. But I think again, I'll be here next week. Tech gifts are nature will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>